as we're left with a little time, we're going to give you a chance to see again the interview we did with the 1985 champion of the world, Dennis Taylor. And we didn't talk about 85. So Dennis, we're going to try and do something today that I don't think's ever been done in a snooker interview. We're going to try and talk without mentioning that particular match. I, I'll go along with that. Okay. Now, the reason I say that is because your career has really been dominated by that one day in Sheffield. But I think people don't actually know what else you've achieved in the game. And do you think that's a, a fair reflection? Yeah, you're probably uh, right, Jason, because I remember having to head off to Canada and play in the Canadian Open in 1974, I think it was. And I'd met our good friend uh, Cliff Thorburn. I played him in the World Championship in 1972-73 season. And I was managing a snooker club and headed off to Toronto. I had 200 pounds in the bank, two children, and I had to pay my own expenses to go there. And that's how my career started. I had to go to Canada. I got to the final, I beat Alex Higgins in the semi-final, and I got to the final, lost to Cliff, but what I did out there against the Montreal champion, Atomic Eddie Aga, he was called, and I made, which people don't remember really, I made a continuous break of 349 in an exhibition. I cleared the table with a century, I broke off, fluked to red, made 134, he broke off, and I made another century, and the total was 349 without missing. And I got invited into Pop Black more on that break that I made, and then it took me 13 years to be an overnight success. <laughs> so going back to 1972, like I say, there was very little sort of television, but what was Dennis Taylor doing before he played snooker professionally? When I moved to uh, England to stay with my aunts in Blackburn, I came over to work, didn't even bring a snooker cue, didn't realise how good it was because back at my hometown in Northern Ireland, in Coal Island, I was the best billiards and snooker player at 14. But I didn't think I was that good until I moved to England and found I was as good as the local amateurs, bought a cue, started practising, and as well as practising, I worked 12-hour shifts in a paper mill my aunt used to say to me after working 12 hours and getting on a bus to go down to Blackburn to practice, what are you doing? You'll kill yourself. She said, I wouldn't mind if you were going to make something out of the game. And that's where I uh, met up with Alex Higgins. He wasn't Hurricane back then. I'd won the British Junior Billiards Championship. He won the All-Ireland Snooker. He moved to Blackburn. I fixed him up with a little flat and we practiced along with Jim Meadowcroft, who sadly is no longer with us. Great, great player was Jim, a uh, great commentator also, and the three of us used to practice for hours and hours, and we did that for a couple of years, and then Alex, of course, won the World Championship in 1972. So, yeah, so in 72, the year you turned professional, you'd been practicing with Alex before then? Yeah, uh, in fact, it would have been then. He won the World Championship 72 against John Spencer, so 73, they opened the game up, and I was number 16, and the, there was only 16 professionals in the world. And John Spencer, who was three times a world champion, uh, he put me forward, he proposed me to be a professional. The people, I mean, Fred Davis, Rex Williams, who were on the board at the time, didn't know who I was. So it was all down to John Spencer that I was accepted as a professional, because I played a lot of exhibitions against John uh, all around Lancashire. Wow. So, I mean, World Championship debut 73, and you actually narrowly lose, I think, this time to Cliff. And that was, I guess, almost the start of a, a friendship that, as we sit here now, is, is almost bordering on 50 years. And people talk about Stephen Hendry changing the game. Uh, they talk about the way Steve Davis changed the game when they came along, and then the latter players. But... For you, when Cliff Thorburn came over from Canada, was he playing shots on a snooker table you hadn't seen before? He sort of introduced some new shots into the game. I mean, I remember thinking, because uh, Cliff had came from playing on, on, on pockets on the tables that were quite generous. And I thought, well, I, I could have an easy match here in the first round, but he'd spent a few weeks 
practicing and getting used to the pockets. And if I had played him a week before, I probably would have beaten him. But he'd got used to the tight, tighter pockets. And he beat me on a, I think it was a deciding frame. We had a great yeah. match at the, uh, it was in Manchester. Uh, that was the first time a multiple table was used. And uh, from that day until now, we remained best friends, enemies on the, we had so many great battles on the snooker table. But as soon as it finished, arms around each other. And uh, even to this day, he's, he's my favorite person in all the world, I absolutely love him to bits. So you reach, moving on from 73, you reach, you reach your first world semi-final in 75. You lose to Charlton. I think that was the one time the world championship was played in Australia. Then you get there again in 77, when I think you come up against Cliff again, first time at the Crucible. Yeah. So by the time you get to 79 and you beat JV in a semi-final, you get to your first world final, do you think it must be your time? Well, yeah, I mean, I'm just going back, you mentioned 75. I remember the local brewery uh, giving me 20 shows, 20 pounds a night. I went to see them, I said, I'm going, I've got to pay my own way to go to Australia to play in the World Championship. And they give me 20 shows at 20 pound a time, and that paid for me to go to Australia. And I almost got to the final, Eddie, as you say, Eddie Charlton beat me. Funny enough, Alex Higgins lost in the other semi-final, but that was a big uh, turning point as well. But 77, the first ever uh, Crucible World Championship, and uh, I did get to the semi-final, and Cliff was there to knock me out. Uh, and he, he, he could have won it that year. He lost to John Spencer, mm. but we, I think it was 17-15, we had an unbelievable battle. But then the game became so popular and then when I got to the final in 1979, uh, that's when the game really took off. And two new players, Terry Griffiths and myself, did a lot for the game. It got a lot of people interested in watching uh, because there were two new names there. And I had contact lens with my very bad eyesight. I always took my glasses off to play. And then I'd got these contact lens. And I beat Steve Davis that year. Barry Hearn thought he was going to be world champion that year. I beat the great Ray Reardon. You beat the number times. one seed, oh. yeah. And I <clears> thought, these contact lands are incredible. I lost in the final. I led 15-13 and Terry beat me on the final day. But I couldn't get on with the contact lens. And then Jack Carnham, who used to work with the BBC and was a professional, and his family business was making spectacles. And I went to his home in Bracknell and he made me those upside down glasses that he used to wear, but nobody seen them on television. And without Jack Carnham, I wouldn't have beat the great, oh no, we're not gonna mention that. Year we, wouldn't, we wouldn't mention it. We won't mention, but without the upside down glasses, I would So that never. was after the 79 final, you first started wearing them in 80, is that right? Uh, no, I, I, I had contact lens 79, and I, I, I then started playing without any aid at all, and then I thought, this is no good. I've got to get some glasses. 1983 was the first time I wore the upside down glasses. I'll never forget, we were in South Africa. I think it was Johannesburg. And I got these big glasses out and people thought it was a bit of a novelty thing. It was just a bit of a joke. And then when they realized uh, I was playing with them, uh, they became a great gimmick, but I would never have been world champion without the big glasses that Jack Carnham made for me. Because going back during that period, and this is what I say about people where I don't think you get credit. 79, all right, you get beaten by Terry Griffiths. It's a wonderful story, the, you know, the amateur who's come through. But like, you were number two in the world. I think Reardon was probably number one. Davis wasn't quite coming on the scene. Did you think that you'd, you'd reached two semi-finals, you'd reached a final? Did you potentially think, well, you were playing as well as ever there? Did you think your time might have passed? Not really, because um, I think 1984, I was playing up in Newcastle in the Jameson, and I was playing out of my skin. I'd got used to the glasses, and I was, I think it was in the quarter final, and I thought, now I'm playing the best snooker in my career. <clears throat> and then I got the devastating news. My mum, who was only 62 years of age and very slim, had a massive heart attack, and I'll never forget having to drive back from Newcastle to Blackburn 
before flying over to Ireland, my world had just collapsed. And there I was playing the best snooker in my whole career. And I didn't even want to know snooker. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was it. I was just going to pack the game up. And my family persuaded me to play in the Grand Prix just a few weeks later. Yeah. And I thought, well, I'll go and play for my mum. And boy, did I play in that uh, Grand Prix. And I think you beat Cliff pretty heavily in the I final. I beat Neil Foles 9-2 in the semi-final. And I think he was number two in the world at the time. Cliff maybe was number three. And I beat Cliff 10-2. Now, to beat two players like that, and Cliff at that time was the toughest player in the game. And to, to win 10-2 in the final was incredible. And then four or five months later, I eventually realized my ambition and picked up that World Championship trophy. Mm. So uh, I had then got maybe two, three seasons traveling all over the world, winning tournaments all over the world. Yeah, people forget that I won the Canadian Masters twice, beating Steve Davis and Jimmy White. Uh, one in Tokyo, beating Steve Davis. One in Australia. You know, I had maybe three or four seasons that were fantastic. And, and then uh, one thing people never mention, the 87 Masters. I that, mean, was, that was up there with my, uh, one of my greatest wins against, against Alex Higgins. I mean, it, Alex hadn't won a tournament for nearly two years. And I wouldn't have won the Masters that year because uh, my good friend uh, who people always say when I won the world title, wagging your finger, it was Trevor East who was head of sport with ITV at the time. Uh, he helped me win that world championship as well as my dear old mum. But he was there at the Masters. I was eight. What was it behind? I was you eight, were eight five down eight, going five into the down, evening yeah. session. Yeah. And I went to the toilet. Alex had gone out and he said, listen, Alex's managers ordered a dozen bottles of champagne to celebrate Alex winning his first title for two years. And when he told me that, I went back into the arena in front of 2,700 people and I won the last four frames. So to beat Alex Higgins uh, on the last frame in the Masters, right up there with um, one of my greatest wins ever. And, and I think <clears throat> until Mark Allen won the Masters this January, that was the last time a player from Northern Ireland had held a, a major title. Exactly, and I was so delighted that Mark Allen did win the Masters. Uh, terrific, and I thought, I, I kept saying this fella can be world champion. And when he won the Masters, I thought, He's got a great chance of winning the world title, but never really produced the snooker in the world championship that he did in the Masters. But listen, he's still a young player, and hopefully he'll be the next player from Northern Ireland to lift a world title. And I think it's been fascinating for me to talk to you, and we say we don't mention, but I think your career has so much been more than just about those two weeks in Sheffield in 85, and I think we've touched on a bit of it. I mean. You were in there when snooker was rock and roll. It was booming, the 80s. You had aftershaves, you had board games. You had, I mean, you know, you were cutting records. I mean, I, I don't think there'll ever come a time again where you'll see a snooker player, Ronnie O'Sullivan cutting a CD with Snoop Dogg or, you know, it, was, it must have been an unbelievable time to be a top sportsman. The mid 80s was incredible. I mean, snooker was bigger than golf back then and there was more viewing figures than watching soccer I mean it was incredible that the 80s what a time to have been involved in the game and I was so lucky as I say when I turned professional in the early 70s with only 16 players in the game to see the game grow and to grow with the game and we've often talked about it Cliff myself we were so lucky to have been involved in that era there's some brilliant players around nowadays uh, and it's great to watch and commentate on them. But you, Jason Francis, have, uh, you know, you've ruined my retirement. <laughs> I'd retired from everything, and then suddenly you get this legend <laughs> snooker going, and I hadn't hit a ball for nearly 10 years. And then all of a sudden I've got the buzz back, because I, I retired because I was speaking at dinners and functions, which I love doing, but I've got the buzz back, the cue. Okay, I can't practice as much as I used to do, because... I'm aching in places when I bend over that table that I never ached in my whole life. But uh, thanks to you, we're now back playing and you've got people like Stephen Hendry, John Parrott, Ken Doherty, Joe Johnson, all the former world champions. And I'll tell you what, the standard in the legends and seniors is going to get better because the boys have got the buzz back. 
Well, you are rightfully here amongst them. As I say, for me, it's never been with you just about that particular year. I think it's been fascinating to have a chat to you about some of the other triumphs you had in your career, and uh, I think we just about got away without mentioning it. So, all the best. 1985. <laughs>